Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's another top 10 list. This is the top 10 worker placement games. Obviously, um, we haven't played them all, but um, you don't get upset if your beloved Euro cube pusher ain't on this list, because it's, uh, you know, like I said, we haven't played them all, or maybe we don't like it, I don't know. But if it's not on there, don't get mad, get even. If you like this video, think about subscribing, push one of the buttons and something. We'd we'll do anything in your life, it doesn't matter, as long as it's useful, yeah. Let's check this list out, top 10 worker placement games. Board games, 4K. Yeah, number 10 is uh, a really, really easy simple game it's a four player game it's called fresco and in this you're uh it's one of the first games that had that whoever gets up first gets the the best dibs but you've got to pay more to get it you know so you you, you sort out your turn order by bidding a certain amount or de depending on where your where your worker wakes up that's that's the sort of actions and things that they can do i mean this was used to great effect in viticulture and um what you're doing is you're sort of gathering paints and then you you're, you're sort of painting and constructing this this uh fresco on, on the on the sort of Sistine Chapel sort of thing so you're all sort of like mini Michelangelo's gathering paint racing to sort of you know complete the, this this big fresco in the center of the board and it's a it's, it's really excellently executed kind of sort of underrated I mean you don't really hear much about it these days but um yeah I mean it's obviously best with four players but it plays well with two as well and there's a couple of mini expansions that you can get for this one so uh, yeah number 10 is uh, Fresco number 9 is uh, Vlada Shavartal's Dungeon Pets it's up here look and um, yeah this is great I mean really it's on, the, on the list mainly I suppose because of the theme I mean it's so original sort of uh, taking the uh, the premise of uh, Dungeon Lords and uh, you're, you're grooming pets for these Dungeon Lords and you're sending your little imp workers out and uh, they're going to you could basically be placing them on action spaces and they're going to be taking actions and you're going to be improving your cages buying different types of pets and then eventually you're going to the, the, the pets will be put into a, a show and then there'll be different criteria each round that will de determine how well you do the light for theme this one so yeah really really original there's nothing really quite like it so it had to be on this list the only trouble is it's, it probably would be higher if it didn't suffer from maybe like that it's got a really really crappy rule book i mean some of the rules in it are so unclear it, it makes your brain bleed there's this this counterintuitive thing with these need cards it makes you think it's one thing but really it turns out it's another so it's a bummer to teach i mean i hate teaching this and it puts me off it would get to the table more if it was a little bit easier you know you can go on youtube watch a few instructional videos but it's still really it's like a, it's, it's like you it's like you're swimming against the tide with this one, but it's a shame because, uh, yeah, if, if, if there was some sort of way of simplifying the rule works explanation, it gets to the table more. But Dungeon Pets, you know, if you can if you can get over that hump, then it's definitely recommended this one. Okay, number eight is uh, well, it's a, it's a Dungeons and Dragons game, but it's not a Dungeons and Dragons game, it's uh, it's uh, Laws of Water Deep over there somewhere, and uh, yeah, with this one, I mean, it's the it's really it's just one of the most simple worker placement games. I mean, forget the DD theme, it's got nothing to do with that. So yeah, you're just placing your worker on a, on the board, taking an action, and um, you what you're trying to do. You've got these quest cards with all these specifications that you've got to meet, and you, you, you're gathering. You play these lords of, of water deep, <laughs> and you're gathering these well, basic resources. But you're gathering wizards and thieves to do your dirty work for you, so you can send them out on these missions. And you trade these cubes, and you're gathering these cubes off the board by placing your workers out. And you're trading them in. And then you get different points based on what's on the uh, on the quest card, and uh, it's, it's 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 so simple. And the expansion makes it kind of better, but only with more players. I mean, I'll, the expansions are, they're essential, but they kind of open the game up too much when there's only say three or four players. So you know you should really play the, the expansions playing with with six players. But yeah, Lords of Waterdeep. I mean, I don't know, it's just a basic worker placement game, but there's something about this one. I don't know, the aesthetic of the board or uh, the setting, I don't know what it is, but it's just something about this one that just makes us keep coming back year after year, year after year, and we, it's still right up there. I mean, this is this is a really fantastic game, Lords of Waterdeep. Number seven is Uwe Rosenberg's Agricola. 
I can hear you all screaming out there thinking, well, Caverna's a better game. Well, we don't think so. We think Agricola's a better game. It's a lot more simple to learn. It's just a couple of workers, chuck them out on the board, do the action, isn't it? And the, the, one of the things that we like about this one is that the cards always come out in a different order and they're revealed systematically throughout the game. So you, you know they're coming, but you don't know in what order. So it's, it, you, you need to overall an overriding plan, but you need to adapt your plan as the game goes on. And that, that's that's what we we like simple simple games not 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 stuff that's too complicated and um, we just found that Caverna just and, and all the other spin-offs just to be a little bit too far off the cliff edge for us you know so we we, we rein it in and we, we stick with this one and uh, you know you've got the occupation cards that mix a game up you got all them all them other decks of cards that you can bung in and it's it's just it still holds up a day i mean it was a classic back in 2008 but now it's it's just it's still still a tasty prospect when this hits the table number six is portal games robinson crusoe adventures on a cursed island and um i've got i've got a feeling this one's going to go down as as an all-time classic you know what i mean so it's just you could tell that it's like a it was a labor of love for mr trevor trevor check I pronounced his name right. Yeah, you can tell that he worked really hard on this, and it's a, it's a, it's like a watershed moment for portal games for us. I mean, everything after that, more or less, hasn't matched the standard. I don't know. You got the fantastic sort of I don't know, windswept artwork in this. The components are absolutely fantastic. There's multiple ways to play this, multiple scenarios, and um, it, you could even though the rule book in the first edition was a load of rubbish. You know, there's just some, there's some, some mysterious charm about this. I don't know, and even you know, even the stuff before that, stronghold and that, it's got, it retains that mystique. I don't know, it's almost like it was new. It was new at the time. There's nothing really like it out there. And as time's gone on, it's a real shame. It's as time's gone on, it's like it's like it's just become a business or something. And you have to churn out the same thing. And it's like this one, Robinson Crusoe, for a worker placement. I mean. You can't beat the, the tension and the, the hilarity of watching the world collapse around you, and it, it's a it's well, well, well deserved game to be on this list. You know, we love Robinson Crusoe, and you can play it solo, you can play it two players, four players. It's just, it's just a phenomenal, a phenomenal achievement. It's right up there. I mean, yeah, got can't really say much more about it. Robinson Crusoe Adventures on the Cursed Island. Number five is Pillars of the Earth. We've not read the book. We don't know who Ken Follett is, and quite frankly, we don't really care. This one, is, it's got a, a really bizarre a sort of turn, a turn order mechanism where you got, you're pulling your master builders out of the bag and sticking them on this sort of like this semicircle, and um, you can pass, and they get it gets cheaper as you to put them out as time goes on, but you don't get to take first pick of the board and it's, it's really clever yeah it's got the um it's got the artwork by the old legends of andor geezers and michael mensel mensel or something but, um, I'm not sure names. but um but yeah uh, pillars of the earth yeah you, you, once once you've determined who goes first and how much they paid then you just go around the board one two three four five six seven and you take uh, the actions in order and um you've got this really nice card card mechanism so you've got, you've got these cards laid out and everybody takes one and that gives you extra stuff and then you're upgrading them as time goes on it's uh yeah as a far as worker placement goes is it it's that hits that sweet spot of complexity depth simplicity and uh yeah it's, it's definitely recommended it was out of print for ages but i mean i think it's back in print now so if you if you haven't got that one then you're gonna have to get it otherwise my rock wall is going to come around and chew your balls off so number four is Sulkin the Mine Calendar and uh, this caused a bit of a furore when it was released a few years ago because it's got that plastic uh, cog mechanism so all you're doing with this one all you're doing is you, you've, got these, um, you've got these little dudes well um, cylinders but they're like cylindrical dudes right you're chucking them on this cog and um, you're just moving the cog forward and you decide when you want to take them off and depending on where you take them off that's the action that you get and you, you're getting corn you're, you're going like these temple tracks and all this sort of thing and it's uh even though it's just a case of just chucking your worker on the cog moving the cog and deciding when to take it off i mean the amount of options that open up as the game progresses 
it's astonishing and it's it's not that complex once you get red around it. I mean I think it's got a bit of a reputation of being a bit complex, but it's not really. I mean uh, Paul Grogan from Gaming Rules, he does a phenomenal, phenomenal rules explanation for this. And if, if you if you haven't got it and you're thinking about playing it and you can't you know, you can't get your red around the rule book, go there and have a look at that and it'll all become clear. It's like an epiphany. But yeah, uh, Sulk in the Mind calendar, definitely recommended one of the best worker placement games we've ever played. So number three on this list is the very, 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 very popular Viticulture. It's uh, from Stonemaier Games, James Stigmeyer, maybe his masterpiece, I don't know. He's still making brilliant games as it is, so yeah. So yeah, this is this uses that fresco, like we said, uses that fresco mechanism where you decide when you wanna, the workers wanna wake up and then you go through spring, summer, autumn, winter, and you, Brewing up wine, trying to flog it, trying not to drink it, because uh, we don't drink no more. Uh, yes, fantastic game, yeah. It works well, all player games. I mean, it goes out of six players, which is always a bonus. We love six players, we love playing with six players. And um, it, it's got the Tuscany expansion. I think you, you need, you definitely need to play it with the Tuscany expansion, or at least the Tuscany Essentials expansion, because it just feels like the, the original version is sort of incomplete. You know, and I think it definitely benefits from the extra board and all the extra bits and bobs. And there's, there's a couple of card expansions for this, like Visitors of the Moor and uh, what's the other one, the Rhine Valley. And you know, you can throw them in if you want, but you know, like all Stonemaier games, you know, but I, there's so many expansions you can just mix and match as you like. So yeah, but this one does differ because I think you do need at least the Tuscany uh, Essentials Edition expansion for this one. But yeah, as a worker placement go, games go. I think this is right up there. You can't, but you well, okay, you can beat it because I'm going to tell you what's going to beat it now. So number two on this list, it's a very simple, easy to learn game, and it's really quick and simple. And it's Stone Age, probably because I feel like a caveman most days when I wake up. But uh, yeah, it's another one of them uh, Michael Mensal illustrated games. It's got fantastic artwork. It's got the uh, very controversial leather bound cup which is sure to annoy vegans or vegetarians or whatever. I'm sure well, it has annoyed them. But um, yeah, I can understand that. But yeah, it's in there. There's a leather cup. <laughs> we don't know why. It could have been made of plastic, whatever. All you're doing, you're choosing how many workers to, to place on the board. And um, there's only there's a limited amount of spaces on, on each action. So you're choosing how many, how many workers to chuck out. And uh, then you, that's how many dice you throw into the, uh, the, the leather cup. Yeah, you're trading in resources to buy huts and get victory points and um, yeah the, I mean the simplicity of this is uh, mind-boggling if that makes sense so yeah Stone Age really one of the most simple it's, it's an old it's an oldish game it's got an expansion which we haven't played with because we can't be bothered but um, yeah if, if you if this one comes out when we want we want to scratch the itch of work worker placement but we haven't got a lot of time and you know we've got like a we're knackered or whatever so yeah, it's up there, number two, and um, Stone Age, ugh. So, number one, the greatest worker placement game ever. Fanfare, please. It's Kalos, the intimidating, allegedly difficult to learn worker placement game. One of the first ones, well, not one of the first ones at all, is it? it's 2005. Seems like ages ago, I mean, it's not that long ago, is it? Was it now 14 years old? But I mean, this uh, the version we got, we, we got scared of the king, so we had to change the cover art because he used to give me nightmares the way he used to stare at you. Um, in this one, you, you, there's a, the king's instructed you to, to build a castle at the top of this hill, and uh, you, you start off at the bottom, and as, you, as the game progresses, you're working your way up the, up the hill, building buildings, uh, getting resources and stuff to build parts of the castle for the king. Uh, but the, the trick is that you've got this this thing called the provost that that goes up and down the path checking for lazy sods. So that intro introduces a bit of take that into the equation, really. I mean, yeah, uh, Kalos, uh, it's uh, not everyone's cup of tea, but this is like a mainstay. It's, it's a, it really gets your brain working. You've got to plan ahead. There's there's no one strategy that works, and it's probably the perfect worker placement game. So I'll talk to you on worker placement games, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.